Okay, why don't we start introductions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for our kickoff webinar of the win winter 2021 Michael M. Davis lecture series. Uh, this Center for Health Administration Studies continues to champion health research and services policy advocacy. In a moment, CHAS co-director and SSA professor Harold Pollack will offer brief opening remarks and provide an introduction for today's presenter. Dr. Bradley Stein, Director of the Opioid Policies Tools and Information Center, which is a clever acronym for OPTIC. Uh, he is also the Senior pol uh, Physician Policy Researcher at the RAND Corporation. Uh, for today's lecture, we're going to leave the chat feature open because there may be a couple of slides that uh, want feedback and, and answers from uh, the audience, but feel Feel free to put questions in the chat feature or the Q&A function, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible by the end of the webinar. A copy of today's PowerPoint will be archived on the Chaz Davis Lectures webpage, and a recording of the webinar will be available on the Chaz website as well as our YouTube channel. I am currently recording, and Dr. Pollack will now introduce today's lecture. Thank you. Thanks so much, Keith. And I will be brief because I, I talked to Brad ahead of time and his mom is in fact not on the Zoom call so I can leave out a few of the items on his 32 page uh, 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 CV. But it's a real honor to introduce Brad, partly because he's just a great human and sort of has a range of experiences and contributions in the opioid space, in the child psychiatry space and health services research. And he's the director of the RAND USC uh, Optics Center, the Opioid Policies Tools and Information Center. And one of the great things about Optic is that it provides tremendous tools, not just for its own research contributions of its own team members, but for the entire field and providing all sorts of resources that, that have allowed the entire uh, sort of audience of people doing opioid research to, to study state policies in a rigorous way to provide sort of public goods type resources for the field. And I think that's just a really admirable model for, uh, for a center like this that is a real resource uh, you know, that brings the strength of RAND, uh, but also really uh, is generous to the field. Uh, Brad's a health policy and services researcher, a practicing psychiatrist. Uh, was teacher of the year, I believe, for uh, in uh, child psychiatry uh, at the Keck School of Medicine, among other, among other awards, and uh, just has a long history of work in school mental health and understanding interventions for for youth at risk, including kids with uh, autism spectrum disorders and, uh, and and other matters, and has now really made huge contributions in the opioid space. So. I'll be quiet now and Brad, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you very, very much. And I, I'm so glad to be here and have the opportunity uh, to participate in uh, the Mike Wemdevis lecture series. Um, so today's talk is uh, about the opioid crisis in state and federal policies. Um, and I'm really going to touch on as opposed to giving answers, I, I, I hope to sort of provoke people to sort of more thoughtfully consider what's going on in this space. Um, I, I do want to start off by gratefully acknowledging all of the support we've received from NIH and NIDA for this work, um, and even more so acknowledging um, so many of my colleagues. You see a list of some of the people here who've contributed directly to this work, um, but certainly so many of our other uh, OPTIC collaborators, both at RAND, at USC, and at other institutions, really. I, I have the benefit of really growing from all they have taught me and sharing with you so many things that we're learning about together. Um, so as I dive into today's talk, you know, it, it's about the opioid crisis and federal policy. So one of the things I actually want to do is ask the people who are participating um, and please put in a chat or just say, when I say the opioid crisis, what is the opioid crisis? When I talk about it, when you think about it, what do I mean by the opioid crisis and what is driving it? And similarly, when we talk about solutions and policies related to the opioid crisis, what, what do you think of? What are the things I'm talking about? I'm, I'm curious what people think. Let, let's, let's start off there. So if folks want to dump into the chat uh, responses, that would be, uh, uh, that'd be great. We have one response, alternative payment models 
That's one response. And criminalization of drug use is driving the overdose crisis. Those are two comments. Uh, Others? Some more com coming in. Fatal overdoses was another suggestion. Harmful harm reduction as a possible solution. Harm reduction again. Um, Andy Fisher, Andy yeah. Fisher from OB. Oh, we get, we're getting more responses. Uh, says for us, the crisis is opioid overdose overdose being the highest cause of maternal mortality. Uh, another response, pharmaceutical companies as driving the epidemic. Uh, another response from Allison Paulson, uh, transition to fentanyl increasing mortality. Uh, Lauren Peterson put forward, who is licensed to prescribe, provide OUD treatments? Getting a lot of responses right. coming in here. Do you want me to keep All going? Right. I, 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 no, I, I, I think we'll have proved my point. I love this question because people yeah. have so many different perspectives, right? And, and, and I think one of the things that I want to point out as we talk about this is oftentimes when people talk about their perspectives, it, it's driven by a number of things but oftentimes it sort of falls into these buckets, right? And so one bucket is sort of this idea of new users and someone mentioned the pharmaceutical companies and sort of putting out opiate analgesics more than what is needed and really pushing those. And then you see policy responses related to that, things in terms of prescription limits or unused prescription disposal. Um, another kind of bucket people tend to really talk a little bit about, and I think some people touched on this, is sort of misuse of those opiate analgesics, people who are taking them and using them in ways that they aren't intended for, um, which then leads to abuse, it leads to overdose, it leads to all kinds of problems. And, and there too, we start to see sort of policy responses, prescription drug monitoring programs, drug reformulation, pain clinic regulations. Um, and certainly the idea of payment sort of both affects both of these. What are we paying for as a health system? The third bucket that we often hear about, and again, people touched on it here, is the idea of treatment and recovery. How are we sort of, what are we doing to enhance access to treatment for individuals who have an opioid use disorder problem? And someone brought up the idea and they're referring to buprenorphine prescribers. And that's something we're gonna to touch on more later, but there are other things, insurance policies for payment, and I think the last bucket, and, and again, there are things to cross this bucket, is this idea of harm reduction. And there are various ways that people approach that. Naloxone laws are certainly one of those things, and making more naloxone available is something critical to sort of reducing overdoses, but also safe consumption sites, fentanyl test strips, a variety of harm reduction policies. And so I think one of the things that as many of us consider this, we think about sort of the crisis and the policy responses in one of these buckets. But one of the things that I think I'm, I'm going to argue today is oftentimes as we're thinking about these, sometimes these policies may be too narrow or too poorly specified to really address some of the complexities that we really face as we're trying to address the opioid crisis. And, and so I think the crisis is particularly complicated complicated because it occurs against a historical and social context. And, and this involves a whole variety of different things. Some that clearly come to mind is with respect to how we stigmatize drug use and the treatment of individuals who misuse drugs, right? That there's a long history in how we've even set up and funded our treatment system um, and how we consider individuals that use drugs and the criminalization of that. So much of this occurs within the context of poverty um, and sort of hopelessness. And certainly some of the discussion around the opioid crisis recently has involved sort of the discussion many of you are probably familiar with sort of the idea of deaths of despair, which links fatalities and overdoses from opioids and alcohol and a number of other causes of fatality with what's going on in a number of our more socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. And I think the other historical and social context that's clearly important as we consider the opioid crisis is systemic racism and how different populations in our country historically and even today are treated very, very differently by parts of the system. And so I'd like to do is actually suggest another frame that we can think about. 
this the opioid crisis in. And, and I'd like to suggest that the opioid crisis is, is something called a wicked problem. And, and that creates policy challenges. And, and when I mention a wicked problem, this really isn't a problem that's just experienced by our friends up in the Boston or New England area. Um, wicked problem is a concept, and those of you may want to sort of learn more about it after this, that there are social problems that are particularly hard to solve because they have a number of particularly important characteristics. Um, there are problems that impose very heavy social and economic burdens. They affect large parts of our society and have a substantial impact across many of those components of society. The, the knowledge of the problem is incomplete or contradictory. And so when I talked about sort of the causes of the crisis, you, you heard people sort of bring different perspectives. And I think one of the things that we've been struggling with with the opioid crisis is really trying to get our arms around the many different facets of the crisis, and in some cases, facets that don't appear to sort of make sense together, that really sort of take some teasing apart. Um, I think an, another aspect of Wicked Problems is that there are many different perspectives and opinions about both their causes and their solutions. How much of it is caused by what the pharmaceutical industry did? How much of it is caused because of some of the historical problems in our treatment system? How much of it is caused because of our society's approach to criminalizing drug using behavior? And depending on your perspectives, this leads you down different sort of solution paths. Um, I think another characteristic of wicked problems that's important to keep in mind is that sometimes whether you're making progress, whether you're having success in addressing it, is really hard to define because it interacts with so many other social issues. And so to the extent that are we making progress on the opioid crisis is so tied into what is going on with our economy, what is going on with many other aspects of our society. And, and, and then the last piece that I do think is true of a wicked problem, and I think it's particularly true of the opioid crisis, is it's really constantly evolving. And so that makes sort of your policy solutions and your targets that you're shooting at sort of constantly moving. The opioid crisis we are kind of experiencing today is really very, very different in many ways than it was five or six years ago and is different then than it was five or six years before that. And, and we can keep going back. So solutions that may have worked very, very well back in 2000, 2005, may have a very, very different effect today because the nature of the problem has changed. All right, so what I'd like to do sort of during the rest of today's talk is, is sort of, oftentimes during these talks, people will dive into a particular study or particular analysis. What, what I'm going to do instead is really sort of touch lightly on some work that myself and my colleagues have been sort of conducting that really I want to explore how this idea of a wicked problem may lead sort of well-intentioned policies to have consequences that we don't expect. Um, in some cases, well-intentioned policies can actually have negative consequences. I want to talk a little bit, a bit about how policies that may be effective on some domains may actually leave other existing problems unaddressed or in other cases, how well-intentioned effective policies that overall are working well may actually widen disparities in the experience of some groups or in, in the experiences of some groups. And, and I really want to end up hopefully in a conversation about how we think about how these challenges and the opioid crisis is a wicked problem and some of the examples I'm going to give you may, may force us to really reconsider how we are thinking about designing and studying opiate policies and effects of those policies. Um, be, because I think as we hope to continue to make progress in the, in the opioid crisis with implementing new policies, considering some of these challenges will allow us to do so more effectively. All right, so the, the first example I want to talk about is how well-intentioned policies can have unanticipated negative consequences. And the example I wanna use is the example of how do we stop people from abusing prescribed opioids? So just a bit of information, so we're all on the same page. You know, before 2010, 
fatal overdose deaths from opioids were really driven by the misuse of prescription opioids. So, so you can see sort of what happened in the decade leading up to 2010. And then subsequent to 2010, you saw an increase in overdose deaths due to heroin. Those of you who are more familiar with this know, know that since probably about 2015, 2016, we've actually seen synthetic opioids such as fentanyl now take over. So this is an example of how the crisis has evolved. So, but back 2000, 2005, really people were focused on the misuse of prescription opioids. And the opioid that they were most concerned about was OxyContin or formulation of OxyContin, which was a high potency opioid um, that was pushed very, very hard by um, Purdue Pharma. And you can see by 2010, actually over half of all of opioid product sales were of one of the OxyContin formulations, oxycodone formulations. Okay. So one of the issues with the original OxyContin is that it was easy to crush and abuse, right? So you can see an example here of the pill when it's crushed. And what they did in 2010 was changed what would happen if you'd crush it so it sort of glommed together. And the idea behind this is it would preserve the sort of medical benefits of the analgesia, but it reduces the potential for non-medical abuse. So you, you can see for an example here, the older version could be crushed and then melted down and injected. And the new formulation really didn't allow that to happen, right? This is a great idea, great policy, great idea, because you're taking one of the drugs that's being most abused and you're really decreasing the likelihood that it can be abused. Did it work? Yeah. If you look at the numbers, after the new formulation was introduced, you can see OxyContin, the rates of misuse were increasing dramatically and then suddenly dropped dramatically. And this was the target of the policy, right? This is what you wanted. But this is one of the examples, and, and this is published in a paper um, by Abby Alpert and a colleague of mine, David Powell, back in 2018. But one of the things that really wasn't as well considered is that when you reformulated OxyContin, you ended up seeing an increase in heroin overdoses. And it really seems that what you had is people who were moving from OxyContin misuse to misusing opioids because you weren't able to crush it and inject it. And so studies have suggested that each percentage point reduction in OxyContin misuse led to three more heroin deaths per 100,000. So I think this is an example of what was a well-intentioned, well-meaning policy change that actually resulted in negative unintended consequences. Um, since this study, this group has gone on to do more work suggesting that these changes have also led to increases in the rate of hepatitis C. So this is, I think, one of those examples of thinking about the policy change what's going on in the area of opioid analgesics without really considering how the, the other piece of sort of illicit markets and what's going to happen there. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think were you to think about this in advance, there were probably things that could have been paired with formulation that would have decreased people going on to misusing heroin and some of the negative consequences of that. Things like making more clean syringes available, making naloxone more available, making sure that there were concerted efforts to make people aware of treatment options. So example one. Example two, you know, even well-meaning, well-intentioned policies, if they don't pay attention to other existing problems, it may not do anything for them. And so here I'm gonna use the example of increasing available buprenorphine care. So let's just, to talk briefly, and I'm sure some of you, this is information that you're already familiar with, but to get us all on the same page, um, inadequate access to effective opioid use disorder treatment is really something we as a society struggle with. Um, it's very clear 
that most people who need treatment for opioid use disorder don't get it. Estimates are it's less than half of individuals who could benefit from treatment in a year don't get it. And even fewer receive medications for opioid use disorder, medications like methadone, like buprenorphine, like naltrexone, which are really the gold standard of treatment and have been shown to be more effective overall in achieving better outcomes than treatment for opioid use disorder that doesn't involve medications. One of the things that we've known for many years is that access to treatment, not even quality, but access to treatment is worse among black and Hispanic individuals. Um, and that's been a long existing problem. We've seen it in other areas of drug treatment. We've seen it overall in opioid use disorder treatment. There have been several studies that have suggested that that is, continues to be the case in terms of buprenorphine treatment. Now, the other point I want to make though, is that oftentimes we focus on access to treatment and, and you hear about, we need to do things to increase access to treatment. But, but I think I'd like to argue that quality of treatment is truly as important to access. If we give people access to treatment without making sure that they're getting adequate quality of treatment, um, it's unclear we're really going to get the types of positive outcomes that we expect from people from having treatment. But I think one of the challenges that we've had is if you look at the majority of policies that have been put in place, both at the federal level and at the state level, oftentimes they're really focused much more on what can we do to provide greater access and really not addressing some of these underlying issues. Um, are we making sure that when people are getting access, they're getting access to better quality treatment? And also, are we making sure that there's equity in, equity in access? that individuals of all racial and ethnic groups, individuals in urban communities and rural communities are all able to get comparable access. So one of the things we wanted to do is really to understand a little bit more about what was going on with the quality of care of treatment with opioid use disorder and if this was the same among different racial and ethnic groups, among people in rural and urban communities. Um, so we're gonna talk now about buprenorphine. We focused on buprenorphine here. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, buprenorphine, as I mentioned, is one of three medications effective in the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, it was approved by the FDA um, in 2002. And buprenorphine can only be prescribed by clinicians who have undergone a bit of additional training in the use of buprenorphine for the treatment of OUD. Um, and when it was first approved in 2002, it was limited to 30 clinicians and over time, I'm sorry, when it was first approved in 2002, each clinician could only treat 30 patients concurrently. And then over the years, the number of patients that could be treated concurrently by trained clinicians has increased next to 100, in, in recent years up to 275. And for those of you who've been following the news, there was actually another policy change um, that's going on over the last several weeks that may or may not, depending on what the federal government decides, actually remove any patient limits at all. I'm sorry, that will make, remove the training requirements. So almost any physician would be able to prescribe buprenorphine without going through that additional training. Um, buprenorphine, like most medications, is only effective if there's an adequate dose and a sufficient uh, adequate dose and sufficient duration of treatment. Um, and while there isn't sort of a gold standard, it's not like penicillin that you need absolutely 10 days, I think in the field most people agree that 180 days is probably what you want. And, and I think this is true for most medications, right? Um, I think the example is penicillin if, or an antibiotic. If you get an antibiotic and you only take two days and not all 10 days or seven days you've been prescribed, it's unlikely to do what the doctor wants it to do. Likewise, if you're supposed to take the pill four times a day and you only take it once a day, you're unlikely to get the benefit. So in the same way, we expect to need adequate dose and adequate duration of buprenorphine treatment. 
So what did we do? We used Medicaid claims data from multiple states um, in 2006 to 2014, which was the most recent data that we had available. And we identified over 300,000 buprenorphine treatment episodes for over 240,000 individuals. And really what we wanted to see are sort of a couple clear indicators of quality. Treatment duration, how many, what percentage of individuals received at least 180 days of treatment? Adequate dosage, how many individuals received at least, at least eight milligrams, which is sort of commonly agreed for most people to be sort of the minimum dosage likely to be effective for opioid use disorder. And then the last one we looked at is kind of the percent of people receiving concurrent anal opiate analgesics with the idea that if someone is actually being treated for opioid use disorder, they probably shouldn't also being, be being prescribed and filling prescriptions for medications which could contribute to their addiction at the same time. Um, now, there are some clinicians in the room and there, there are certainly exceptions to that where you might want to see brief periods of opioid analgesics being prescribed. But in general, that's not something you'd want to see for someone who's being treated for opioid use disorder. So what did we see? All right, let's just walk through these one at a time. So in terms of the duration of buprenorphine treatment, we saw that over time, um, the duration went up, which is exactly what we wanted to see, what you'd hope to see, right? But when we looked at this by different racial and ethnic groups, and during today's briefing, I'm only gonna present the race ethnicity findings, not the raw urban findings. We see that compared to white patients, black and Hispanic patients have significantly shorter treatment duration, which suggests that in terms of this particular quality metric, they're not receiving the same quality as whites. When we look at adequate buprenorphine dose, it jumps around a little bit, Overall, the numbers are pretty good, sort of between 85 and 90%. When we look at by race and ethnicity, here the story is a little bit different. Um, Hispanics, uh, while jumping around, you're seeing rates pretty similar to whites. However, here too, we see that blacks overall are receiving fewer of, there's a higher percentage of black individuals who are not receiving an adequate dosage. Um, when we look at who is receiving concurrent opioids, again, over time, we see the percentage of people receiving concurrent opioids going down. Again, that's sort of what you would want to see. But again, here too, we see sort of the same pattern, right? We see that over time, and, and here you actually would want the lower number. You would want fewer people receiving concurrent opioids. But we see that in general, um, both Blacks and Hispanics are more likely to be receiving concurrent opioids than whites. So again, here, what we're seeing over time is the types of changes in quality, at least with a couple of these metrics we would want to see, but we had in many cases pre-existing disparities in treatment that these policies clearly weren't changing. Right, so this is another example of, we need policies really making sure they're attentive, not just to the overall changes, but what may be going on in different populations. So now let me turn quickly to sort of my third example. And then I, I'm intentionally moving fairly quickly here because I'm hoping we can have a discussion about these things and sort of their larger meaning at the end. Um, and so here I want to sort of explore with you the idea that effective policies may not only not target existing disparities, but they may inadvertently worsen disparities if they're not really focused on equity in terms of the outcome of the policy. And here I'm actually going to pick on one that I think is certainly a favorite of mine, and I, I would suspect many of you, Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, right? So I, I know this is familiar to many of you, but just briefly under the Affordable Care Act, states were allowed to expand Medicaid eligibility for those with incomes that were less than 138% of the federal poverty level. Um, and, and what this really did is for many people who are hovering right around the poverty level, 
they were able to move a tremendous number of individuals who were uninsured and allow them to enroll in Medicaid. Um, this is, I'm sure many of you know, varied by state in 2014, 25 states expanded Medicaid. Um, as of last year, that number had increased to 37 states. Um, this had a tremendous number of beneficial effects. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Some that are particularly important to, relevant to this talk is that individuals with substance use disorders dis, were disproportionately gained eligibility. The, the ability to take advantage of Medicaid expansion was particularly important to individuals with substance use disorders, many of whom um, included individuals with opioid use disorders. Um, and as a result, Medicaid was paying more for SUD treatment than it ever had before, including treatment of opioid use disorder. And studies have really shown that this allowed many people to get treatment for their opioid use disorder that never previously had. And so this was, this I think overall is a wonderful thing and something we applaud. What we were interested in here is did Medicaid expansion help all populations equally? So, <clears throat> here too, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to buprenorphine. And so we've talked about it. And so to examine this question, we used data from ARCOS, which doesn't look at sort of individual behavior, looks at sort of larger aggregates in terms of how buprenorphine is shipped to communities nationwide. And we looked at what happened with sort of buprenorphine being distributed to communities from, two, whoop, I'm sorry, from 2007 through 2017. And then it's sort of a three digit zip code level. Um, we wanted to examine what was the per capita distribution of buprenorphine. What were we seeing sort of over time in terms of distribution of buprenorphine at different zip codes? So to understand how this may have played out in communities with sort of different racial ethnic compositions, we broke those zip codes, zip three groups into quintiles based on the percentage of population that was racial and ethnic minority population versus um, white. So, and now one of the things we wanted to do here though, is we realized that there are many, many other factors that could influence how much buprenorphine was being used and so how it was being distributed. And so in the analysis, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, if anyone is interested, please follow up with me and I would be happy to share with you. Um, but in the regression that I'm going to show you, we controlled for a whole variety of other factors that are likely to be associated with the use of buprenorphine. Um, things having to do with education, things having to do with poverty, unemployment, insurance, um, the severity of the opioid problem in the community, uh, using overdose rates, fatal overdose rates as a proxy. And so what did we see? Let me go in the right direction. So not surprisingly, and, and I think encouraging, we saw that over time, the amount of buprenorphine distributed went up. And, and this is consistent with the story that more and more people were getting buprenorphine. Wonderful. But when we looked at it broken out by the racial ethnic characteristics of the three digit zips we were looking at, what you see is there are dramatic differences in the per capita distribution of buprenorphine by those zip codes with far higher rates going to individuals in communities with the fewest individuals of color and the highest and, and the lowest distribution of buprenorphine going to communities with the highest percentage of racial and ethnic minorities. So now let me turn to this slide where the story gets even more interesting. So we did the same thing looking at distribution over time, but then we looked at it, looking at sort of zip codes in Medicaid expansion states versus in non-expansion states, okay? And what we're seeing here 
is that you sort of see the same pattern based on race and race and minority. Um, but you see that sort of over time, really where buprenorphine took off was in the Medicaid expansion states um, in the communities that had the highest percentage of whites. If you look at what went on in communities with the highest percentage of racial and ethnic minorities, you actually see very, very little difference in terms of Medicaid expansion. And so I think the, the story here is we're beginning to understand it is yes, Medicaid expansion mattered. And it really did seem to, uh, Medicaid expansion mattered in terms of buprenorphine. But where it really seemed to matter was in those communities with the highest percentage of whites and with the fewest racial and ethnic minorities. If you actually looked at what went on in those communities that had the most individuals of color, Medicaid expansion really didn't seem to make that much of a difference. There was a question in the chat, Brad, about whether there were whether you examine gender or gender by race in thinking about you know what, uh, how how Medicaid expansion might have have uh, improved access for you know for women or men differentially. We examined gender. We didn't examine gender by race. Well, and, and for here, we need to go back to sort of the prior one. I reminder, this is sort of at the aggregate level. So this is sort of at the county level, not the individual level. If we go back to the prior analyses in Medicaid, I will tell you that pretty, pretty consistently, if we look at issues related to access and quality, um, women and men look pretty different. Or, or, let me rephrase that. Women and men are pretty consistently significantly different with women more likely to be receiving higher quality than men. Um, and that tends to be true across most of the outcomes we look at. Hmm. Thank you. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to dive into that, but, but I think, in general, at the high level, my way of thinking about that is compared that women are more likely to be more engaged with their health care than men are. Um, and so to the extent that some of getting better quality care is sort of showing up at doctor's appointments and doing what the doctor tells you to do, um, I think women in general are more likely to do that than men. And, and I also think that, and it wasn't part of our studies, but my understanding is in general, when people look at sort of health utilization in terms of married men versus single men, that married men consistently do better because their wives are encouraging them to do so. And in some cases calling the doctor on their behalf and men who are not married don't have that advocate for them. There's also a question in the chat uh, that says, I wonder if there's a relationship between policing rates and the distribution of, of BUP when comparing those quintiles of community makeup. So sort of policing and, and BUP distribution. Is that something that you guys look at? That's really a good question. It's, it's not something we've looked at. Um, but I would be interested in seeing it. You know, I, I, I think where we'd be more likely to see an impact is if we were to look at sort of opioid analgesic distribution and what may happen with that because you're going to have more diversion there. I think with buprenorphine, it may be less likely to be the case. One of the things that I think it's important to understand about buprenorphine is people oftentimes get concerned about sort of buprenorphine being diverted. But one of the things we've learned is that when buprenorphine is being diverted, in general, it, it's not being diverted because people were using it to sort of get high or misuse it in the way they may have been using OxyContin. Um, individuals are using it in the vast majority of cases actually to self-treat um, because for whatever reason, either because they can't or they're not willing at that time to be engaged with the healthcare system. Um, so, I, 
my my a priori is that you probably wouldn't see as much of an impact with policing on buprenorphine distribution as you might on opiate analgesic, but certainly something that would be interesting thinking about. Now, I, I love these ideas because we're always trying to understand more about sort of the context of the communities and how that may be influencing some of the outcomes we're looking at. Others, Harold? Uh, there was one question. Should said, I go on? How, how inconsistent are healthcare outcomes between African American women and white women, and what are the reasons? Um, wow, that that that's a much much larger question. I we in terms of these types of analyses haven't really been able to look at outcomes in terms of clinical outcomes as much, which I think is really what the questioner is driving at. Um, I would suspect based on my understanding of the literature that there's certainly, one would expect outcomes in general across the races um, and a whole variety of that. But in general, it's pretty clear that in many cases that there are issues in terms of black women versus white women, black men versus white men, in terms of both the ability to access care and then the quality of care they get once they access care. And, and both of those are clearly related, but, but they're also different, right? Because they require somewhat different levers. And I, I think it sort of gets to that point I was trying to make earlier, that in terms of addressing equities, we need to concentrate not just on access, but Anytime we say improving access, we should say improving access and quality. The, the two should go hand in hand because that's what's needed for the outcomes we want to need and that everyone deserves. Thanks. I think that's, you can, you may continue. There's, I think you, you were responsive. Thank to you. Um, so, so anyway, the, the last point on this particular story um, and, and then we'll sort of get the last slide is here we're sort of comparing the, the group that is left off of this slide is sort of the group with in those communities with the greatest percentage of racial and ethnic minorities. And on the left hand, you can see sort of what was going on in terms of the buprenorphine distribution per capita before the ACA. And you can see that in general, ACA states, the rates were higher than the non-ACA states, but in general, it wasn't great, but like in the non-expansion states, it it was relatively lousy, but equitable. And in the expansion states, there were disparities. They were not, there were disparities there and certainly room for improvement, but the disparities weren't so wide. If we now look at what happened after Medicaid expansion, what you see is the good news is that um, after the ACA, you do see overall improvement. That's wonderful. Yes, you have disparities there. They're somewhat worse. They're not tremendous. But wow, if you look at what happened in the expansion states after the ACA, you, it really drives home that yes, while there's so much more buprenorphine distribution, it really accrued primarily to being distributed in those counties that were in the highest quintile of those um, that were white and had the fewest racial and ethnic minorities. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've given a very high level tour of a couple analyses here. Um, and I, I sort of did that intentionally. And some of these papers were published, some are coming out soon. Be happy if those of you who are interested in the details of some of these analyses to share with them with you or put you in touch with some of my colleagues to the ones who are doing most of this heavy lifting. Um, but I, I think the point I wanted to make overall is that as we think about policy answers for the opioid crisis, which is this wicked problem. And, and I would guess that this is probably true for other wicked problems. Um, although I haven't studied them, so I, I, others may disagree with me, that it's critically important as we think about policies, we need to think about how the problem interacts with other social issues. When we talk about getting rid of the X to have more buprenorphine prescribing, 
what does that mean in terms of the social context that we're talking about? When we're talking about safe consumption sites um, or syringe exchange programs, what does that mean in terms of where do we locate those programs so that it's equitable? I, I'd also like to suggest that like simple answers make wonderful talking points. They may not always make the best policy. These, these issues are complicated and, and it doesn't mean that we don't need incremental progress, but beware of anyone who says, well, you know, the answer to the opioid crisis is we should X or we should Y Be, because I think it's more complicated than that. I think we need to really pay attention and not assume that policies are going to produce change that we'd like to think they are going to produce. If the policy and policy components don't in some way focus on the desired outcome, right? Be because there are so many unintended consequences and so much complexity around these that we need to sort of think about does the policy, not just do we hope it gets us to where we wanna be, but, but can we sort of draw that path? I think this is particularly important because disadvantaged populations, and, and this is true of a whole variety of disadvantaged populations, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, people in rural communities, individuals with comorbid mental health disorders, are all sort of populations at substantial risk related to the opioid crisis. And I think these are the populations most at risk from not benefiting at policies that, that don't at least pay attention to these details. Um, I think one of the additional things, and certainly the ACA analysis brought this home to me, let's be clear, I, I love Medicaid expansion personally. I think it's a wonderful policy, um, but it, it was eye-opening to me to see that this policy I thought was wonderful it actually, while it improved things, it actually widened some of the disparities here. And I think we need to keep that in mind. And I think the final point is that there are really no silver bullets. This is complicated, it's hard. If it wasn't, we would have solved it a while ago. But as we talk about policies and the opioid crisis, it's trickier than we think, and we need to keep some of these things in mind. So thank you very much. I realize I covered a lot of ground there very, very quickly. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay. Um... By the way, there was uh, two final things in the chat, and I'll let Keith, I'm not sure how we want to open things up in the best way. Um, just Emily Claypool said, there's also a story here about how opioids tend to be whitened or deracialized and made a reference to Helena Hansen's work. Uh, Andrew Fisher asked about, about uh, their policy considerations around telehealth for OUD visits to overcome access issues. and and there's more that are accumulating, but those are the first two. Well, so let me touch on this. Yes, I, I think there's really a very clear story and people have written and talked much more eloquently than I will about how we've really as a society considered the opioid crisis very, very differently than we've considered prior to our crises. The most recent one would be the cocaine and crack crisis in terms of how we think about criminalization, in terms of how we think about penalties, in terms of how we think about treatment, in terms of how we talk about it. Um, and I, I think certainly the entire history of criminalization of drugs and drug policy in this country can't be discussed intelligently with, without recognizing sort of the historical racial underpinnings of a lot of those policies. Um, it, it's something I'm still continuing to appreciate and I'm sure there are those in the room who understand that much better than I do, but I think that that is critically important. Um, I think the telehealth one is a great example because again, clearly it is really, really, well, not clearly, but I, I think most of us very strongly believe it's been really important, particularly with related to the treatment of opioid use disorder been critically important during the pandemic. Um, when we did see such a dramatic decrease in the use of so, so much healthcare, but at least some of the data coming out are related to opioid use disorder treatment, related to buprenorphine, um, uh, 
I have some colleagues um, at the University of Michigan, University of Indiana that I recently collaborated with and they did a fantastic job showing how buprenorphine really didn't have some of the decreases that we saw for the other types of medications. And so telehealth, I think there has lots of benefits, but I think we are far too quick to gloss over some of the challenges with telehealth that I think we are inattentive to. There are communities throughout the United States that, that don't have the infrastructure that really allow the types of telehealth that you need to deliver healthcare. And oftentimes people say, well, you know, yeah, sure, but the, these are rural communities and they're primarily sort of trees or cows. Um, and I don't think that's true. One, there are a tremendous number of individuals who live in those rural communities, but, but it's also not true in our urban communities where so many individuals don't have the infrastructure they really need for telehealth care. But the other thing I think certainly all of us on this call are pretty comfortable, and some of us more comfortable than others in terms of Zoom and telehealth and using this technology. But I have tremendous numbers of patients who aren't. That like the folks I'm treating now that it's primarily by phone because they don't have smartphones and, and they're not comfortable with Zoom. So I, I think telehealth is one of these policy areas that as we understand what may have happened during the pandemic, um, both in, with respect to abuse disorder and more broadly, I, I think that that may be one of those overall good policies that may have actually widened disparities. We're, we're doing a little bit of work in that area. Um, and I know others are too, and I, I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. Uh, two questions also came in. Uh, one is uh, from Gabriela Zapata Alma. Uh, how, what are your thoughts on the impact of maternal infant health of existing policies related to perinatal and parental opioid use? Um, so, you know, we've, we've actually done some work here, and if, if you're not familiar with this work, I, I very much encourage you to look at the work of a couple of colleagues of mine, Stephen Patrick, who's down at Vanderbilt, and Laura Faraday, um, who's a colleague of mine at RAND, and, and we've done some work together looking at a number of the policies that states have put in place related to drug use in pregnant women, some of which have been sort of supportive of treatment and others that will sort of view as punitive or, or criminalizing that behavior. Um, and while I think the story is mixed, I, I think what we're seeing there is that this idea of, well, we're going to get pregnant women to stop using drugs by criminalizing their behavior act actually does not work that way. And in many cases may actually worsen the situation. Um, but sadly, states have been far more active in putting in place punitive or criminalizing policies in terms of perinatal substance use, in terms of putting in place supportive policies. And those policies actually appear in some cases to be support associated with higher rates of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome or infants being born um, physically withdrawing from opioids, which is indicative of the mother using opioids in the last um, trimester. So this, this is another area that while I think we need more work, it, it's pretty clear that the policy approaches we are putting in place, the, these aren't even sort of well-meaning, well-intentioned policies. The, these are sort of punitive policies that in some cases are backfiring and are likely harmful for the child, harmful for the family, and may certainly increase family disruption um, in the postnatal period, um, none of which is consistent with what we think is best for the child. Boy, um, there's so many aspects of what you're saying that have resonances back to the crack epidemic, back to earlier heroin uh, epidemics. I mean, certainly the the way that that uh, pregnant and parenting women who had who had cocaine use disorders were uh, uh, were were stigmatized in a way that led many to fear seeking help, that that was, uh, you know, we, we don't want to repeat that policy. And especially because what's really important for so many of these parents is, is their ability to parent that child when that child comes home. And if you really criminalize drug use during pregnancy, you basically lose the opportunity to engage that person uh, and help them with the parenting challenge that they're about to face. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's the idea of if we don't learn from history, we may be to con condemned to repeat it. And, and I do think, 
here too, this idea of as opposed to looking just at a snapshot, let, let's consider the complexities of here. And that period of pregnancy is, is a thin slice of what occurring, is occurring in that woman and subsequently her family's life. And is our goal really to try to address and stop drug use at a very thin slice? Or is the goal really to try to help that woman and her family have a happy, successful, thriving life and child? Um, and, and, and sometimes I think our policies are sort of focused on that one particular silo as opposed to sort of thinking about the somewhat more complex problems here, but how policies may be designed to address them. Another question in the chat, are there policy considerations around expanding uh, uh, buprenorphine OUD treatment for incarcerated individuals that you want to, uh, that you want to talk about? I think, so this is an area that I have not done much work in, but let me say that in terms of a population that we know has incredibly high rates of substance use disorder and opiate use disorder. Um, it's criminally justice involved populations and incarcerated populations. And fortunately, I think that the, the sort of trajectory right now is we're seeing lots of places think about providing medication treatment for opiate use disorder more robustly as individuals are released from incarceration, but also even while they are incarcerated. Um, and, and I think if I had to pick one particular population for whom I think we would get the biggest bang from our buck from really delivering more effective, robust treatment to them, it would be that population. Um, we've just done such a lousy job we know that rates of relapse are high, rates of overdose are high, um, and it, it's just a systemic failure because we have these two systems and we haven't sort of been able to bridge that gap. Um, but fortunately, my sense is that policies are moving in that direction, but there remains a tremendous amount of stigma related to both drug use and criminal behavior and among, um, sort of individuals involved with justice, there's a wide discrepancy of views on using medication to treat opiate use disorder. Um, and while I think people are being educated and realizing its effectiveness, there's still, I think, among some populations, among some of the leaders, tremendous reluctance. By the way, a number of the people in the audience are involved with NIDA's JCOIN, which is Justice Community Opioid Innovation Network, uh, JCOIN efforts, and we have a major center here at the University of Chicago that John Schneider and I are uh, co-PIs on and also a number of randomized trials to try to help people basically right when they're leaving the secure environment uh, where we know that there's very high overdose relapse rate within the first couple of weeks of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of release. There, um, uh, the um, uh, other questions that folks might have uh, from the, um, from the community? Earl, there's several in the um, chat function. So uh, um, the, um, let's see what I, I'm trying to remember which ones I've gone through. Yeah, I think, I think R. Del Rio had the next question. What is the decision change? What is, decision, what is the decision chain, the different steps of leadership that go into determining who receives buprenorphine? I, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, I, I, I don't know that there is a decision chain if I'm understanding it properly. And it, in many cases, it really does seem very arbitrary. Are you able to find a clinician that is willing to take you on a, as a patient and prescribe buprenorphine? Um, and my sense is that there are lots of clinicians out there who are willing to, and some who are not. And so some of it is, 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 is the physician who you're going to, you know, to 
the waiver to prescribe buprenorphine requires sort of eight hours of continuing medical education training. For me to keep my license in Pennsylvania, I had to get 100 hours in the last two years. So it, it's, it's a little bit of time spent that I'm going to need to spend in continuing medical education anyway. So is, is it, are you seeing a clinician who can prescribe? And if so, are they willing to prescribe? Um, but I, in that, there, there's a whole bunch of sort of luck and arbitrariness in sort of that piece. Um, I, God, I, I would like it if our healthcare system was organized in a much more logical decision, sort of thoughtful way. Well, Mary Beth Shapley has a question about Medicaid and managed care. I'm located in Illinois, which expanded Medicaid. However, the state has since moved most Medicaid recipients into a managed care plan. Has any of your research looked at the differences between MAT for traditional Medicaid recipients versus managed Medicaid? Um, the, the answer to that question is if Harold is willing to bring me back in a year, I hope to have an answer to that question. We have that analysis going on as we speak, um, but it's not far enough along that I have a good answer for you, but it's something that I'm really wondering too, but, but I'm, I'm actually gonna add a little bit of nuance here. It's not just managed, managed Medicaid, but within managed Medicaid, the approaches seem to be pretty different to how they're handling it. And we're really, really curious to sort of understand some of those nuances. Um, so I, th I think it's an incredibly important question that I we're trying to chase down. I'm not aware of anyone that really has an answer to it yet. Great question. So Harold Pollack in the, in the crowd had two questions. Uh, uh, one question is, you know, you mentioned sort of the way that sometimes history leads us astray. And, you know, if we, so, you know, the example with the tamper resistant, uh, you know, oxycodone formulations and so on. The opioid epidemic is the dominant paradigm for SUD policy now. And we have all these other issues, uh, stimulants, alcohol. Are there any mistakes that we are vulnerable to making now because of our experience in the opioid epidemic as we look ahead. Uh, it, seems, it seems like that is a real risk that we could, uh, you know, that, that we see so many dead bodies from opioids that, that whatever's optimal for opioids, we're gonna to apply to everything. Yeah, so I, I, I could go on for a while about this, but, but let me sort of touch on a couple. Um, one is, and I think this is actually some, a mistake we're making within opioids too, is compared to those other drugs that you mentioned or that can be misused, um, opioids are more likely to kill you. So we have much higher fatality rates, okay? Um, but, you know, the, the human cost, the societal cost of opioids extends so, so far beyond fatalities. That, that really is just the tip of, tip of the iceberg. And, and I think my concern here is for these other drugs where rates of fatalities not, may not be as high, people say, well, yeah, but we don't have as many people dying as we did opioids, which sort of immediately neglects all of these other costs to the individual, to society, to their families that, that we really don't pay attention to, uh, right? Also, so, so I think- Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go on. Uh, the issue I'm sorry, Harold? Poly, I think one issue that, that came to mind right away is also the reality of polysubstance use and that almost, that most of the people who have really significant substance use issues, you know, many or most of them have multiple substances somehow in the mix. And you can you yep. can you can help people with their opioids through MOUD, through Narcan, and so on. You know, they, if they've got an alcohol issue that's also going on or whatever, we got to make sure that we're dealing with that too. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I, I think the other one that you touch on is right now, we we do have medications that are effective to treat opioid use disorder, and while there's some early encouraging studies for some of the for uh, methamphetamine, we, we don't have quite that armamentarium for others. And so we do need to think about how do we robustly treat it in a way where we don't have medications. Um, but, but I think that sort of runs us up against a challenge that I, I do think we need to think about and not solve, which is, 
the, I, th I think the problem here is the specialty treatment system is not and, and will never be robust enough to deal with the numbers of people struggling with opioids. It, it's just not, it's not designed that way. And so one of the things that I think is really encouraging about treatment of opioids is thinking about that this really is a healthcare problem. And what can we handle? How, what is the role of primary care in addressing this? And, and you see this beginning change in opioids and we've done it previously in our society, right? We, we've done it with respect to treatment of major depression, which 30, 40 years ago was almost always in specialty care and now much of it is in primary care. We've done it with treatment of HIV, which initially had to be done by specialists and now primary care has a role. I, I think one of the challenges we're gonna have is yes, we're not gonna have medications or we may not have them initially, we will have to get them, but can we think about that there is this role for primary care and we just don't throw it away with opioids. What is the role of primary care more fundamentally in treating substance use disorders in our society? It, 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 it's, we don't take care of widespread public health issues treating them in specialty care. They, there, our healthcare system isn't designed in that way. And so how can we sort of bring these pieces together, which I think is something that's gonna be critical By the way, I going think also forward with respect. In terms of patient attitudes and self-perception and stigma, the primary, I think a variety of behavioral health, mental health issues are always going to be in primary care because many of us will not seek out the specialty sector because of stigma and, and because of so many reasons why that's often the human experience of specialty treatment for these things is often very painful for people compared to going to their primary care doctor who they have a relationship with and it's part of uh, and, and it's part of their, their the, the normative experience of care in a different way. It couldn't agree more. And, and that doesn't mean that specialty care doesn't have a role. It, it, it will and will continue to have a critical role. But how do we sort of get these places to work better together in, in sort of treating the individual more holistically? And, and, and I think that's sort of both one of the opportunities and challenges moving forward, both within the opioid crisis and as the, during future drug crises. I, I don't know what they're going to be, but we know they're going to be there. But I was real, and I'll get to the questions in a second. I was really struck when I went, the first time I went to a methadone clinic, I was just really struck. Like it was just, it was just a very, it was a very tough environment. It was, it did yeah. not look like medical care. When you spoke of quality of care, one real big dimension of quality of care is, are the people nice to me? And did I have a positive experience with the person who took my insurance card sitting behind the plastic uh, you know, barrier? And did I feel like I want to come back there? And uh, yeah. you know, addiction is one of the only areas where when the patients don't come back, we say the patient is not compliant. You know, if, if you showed up at the diabetes clinic, you didn't come back, people would say, wow, that's a real, what, what's, what's going on there? You know, nobody wants to come yep. back to the University of, of Wyoming diabetes clinic. It must be a terrible place. With methadone, people say like the, the patients are being non-adherent. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, that, I'm sorry, two, two questions in the chat. One is from Ben Hansen. By a lot of people from out of U of C came to join you today. I think that's great. Uh, how could or should other policies potentially interact with substance use uh, treatment? For, for instance, paid sick leave, short-term or long-term short or long -term disability SSDI? Well, and, and I think that gets to this idea of sort of the wicked problem, right? Um, in that a range of other policies related to payment, related to disability may very much influence in, in, in not only influence, have unintended consequences in the effective treatment of opioid use disorders. And while I am not an expert in those other areas, I suspect a number of you are, I do think that as we are thinking about how do we consider policy regimes, that thinking about not only payment, because anytime someone talks about healthcare, like payment comes to mind, um, but disability, 
paid time off, right? There are any number of these other policies that quite clearly, if you take a step back and think about the experience with someone with a substance use disorder or their family, who in many cases is so critical to helping them get and stay engaged in treatment, how can we get these policies to better align, right? But we, we can go through this in other places too, um, in terms of housing policy, right? We, we have housing policies where we know one of the most critical things of someone succeeding in treatment is having stable housing. And realizing we have a chronic disorder where relapses are common and the possibility that in lots of public housing, which many individuals are going to be in, a single drug related violation means you can lose that housing. Well, like, this is crazy, right? This, this is like taking away one of the most important foundations for successful treatment and saying, you know, if, if, if you mess up once, I'm going to take it away. Like, if, if we don't do that with other disorders, like you hear about us doing this in the drug area all the time. But if, if someone has diabetes and shows up in a hospital sort of in ketoacidosis, it's not like, oh, well, you, you messed up your diabetes care, so we're no longer going to give you insulin. It's like, how can we treat this better? So I, I think underlying this is a stigma. There are a whole variety of issues. Yes, you, I'm sorry, you got me up on my soapbox. I, oh, I, I started to go off. No, I'm going to be on my soapbox for a second, and then I'll ask uh, another question from the gallery, which is there's also the people that are involved in drug selling. And you know, one of the inconsistencies in housing policies, if I commit, if I go after my neighbor with a baseball bat, I'm not automatically disqualified from being in public housing. If, I am if I'm convicted of a drug felony, I, I am. And there are people who make their living in the drug economy uh, who, who need housing and who may also, by the way, very often have substance use disorders themselves. And, and thinking about, and one of the nice changes in public policy, I think, over the past decade is there's been a bipartisan realization that we have to think differently about sort of the drug war and, and how, to, uh, how to use criminal justice to focus on public safety as opposed to uh, arresting everybody that we could arrest who's in the, on the supply side of the drug economy, but that's another aspect. Uh, but I will say, just so we get to it, R. Del Rio says, I worry that we may be throwing the baby out with the bathwater by saying ACA expansion contributed to inequality without looking at the finer details of policy decisions taking place at local levels. So I want to make sure to get that out there. Well, and, and, and let me be very, very clear. I. I in, in no way should anyone please interpret anything I said today by saying we should not have the ACA. Do I think it needs to be expanded? Yes. Um, and yes, there are many other factors and this is an ongoing analysis, but, but I think, and, and we've seen this with other things, that even effective policies can widen disparities. And so just because we've made progress in raising all boats, doesn't mean we need to continue to pay attention in making sure that the votes of all populations are rising to the level that we need them to. Um, and, and yes, all of these things are complicated. And while I've shared with you many of the complications we've stumbled across, um, there are far smarter researchers in this room um, who are going to look at the work that I'm doing and I've done and say, Brad, how could you not have thought of this? You ignored these nuances. Here's an incredibly important finding that really shows something you should have think of. And, and, and that's, that's why I love this work is we're always learning and I love people to come along and challenge and take the work I'm doing and push me and, and or take it to the next level. I think that's how we learn and that's how we improve. Speaking of smarter researchers, uh, David Bradford has a question. Uh, I was very intrigued oh, by no. the work. <laughs> I was very intrigued by the work using the historical ARCOS at the three-digit zip code level. There's a lot to be learned about the impact of opioid flows via licit routes, via licit routes from that. Uh, but a lot that is hidden when we can't differentiate flows to different outlets. For example, pharmacies, mid-level providers, hospitals, and so on, at that aggregated level. Do you think there are any avenues to convince the DEA 
to release the transaction level data under data use agreements to academic researchers? Uh, David, um, le let's just say that, as you probably suspect, I have colleagues that have also raised this issue and been questioning it. Um, the Arcos is not something I am as familiar with as having my hands in. I, I do know, and people have talked to me about different ways of potentially disaggregating Arcos into somewhat more granular information that in some way may be useful. Um, I am not the expert on that, but if you reach out to me, um, I would be more than happy to connect you with some of uh, the people who are thinking in this area. By the way, Daniel uh, Guth, I may be mispronouncing your name. I'm sorry, Daniel. Uh, it says the Arcos data uh, are available at the individual level from the Washington Post and has a link in there. Uh, the, um, I was struck by the way, when I was helping a municipality in a lawsuit against uh, Purdue and there were a bunch of individual um, a bunch of individuals who are major consumers. And I just Googled the doctors that were mentioned and it was amazing how many of them uh, were showing up as, you know, in legal proceedings and they were continuing to be major, uh, major consumers of, uh, uh, you know, of, of clearly questionable conduct by the pharmaceutical suppliers and distributors. Uh, there are yeah. other, other questions uh, from, uh, uh, from the audience or from Keith or from others. No, we're, we're almost at 150. So I think we have time for one more question if it pops in. Brad, this has been just a terrific discussion. I think you've really raised so many issues and educated people. And you gave, you, you gave us something to learn if people were experts and also if people were relatively new to the topic, which is, uh, which is a great uh, and I think we, looking at the audience, I think we had a mixture of, of uh, generalists and specialists. So I, thank you so much for, uh, for giving such a great talk. And, uh, I, and I know that up on, this, up on the screen we have, uh, you can be reached at stein at rand.org and people should reach out if they have uh, questions and admonitions uh, to you. Uh, anything you wanna to say to close us out? Well, please do. Harold, thank you and Keith so much for the opportunity and for making this uh, such a seamless presentation. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I love the questions, I, right? I, I find this such a fascinating area. Um, and so please with questions or ideas or thoughts or criticisms, um, you have my contact information, please reach out. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with OPTIC, myself and my colleagues are doing a whole variety of work in this area. I was only able to touch on some of it, so check us out. But um, we, we love collaborating with others and learning from others. So um, again, thanks again, really enjoyed it. Well, thank you everyone for joining. There's lots of thank yous in the chat. Uh, so so uh, I'll definitely have you back when you have uh, further results, uh, let us know. And, uh, and we'd love to have you back again. And uh, uh, Keith, anything we should say as a parting announcement or anything for folks that are on? No, thank you for joining us today. We have uh, four more lectures coming up this winter quarter and uh, we welcome anyone to, to join us in the future. Thank you, Dr. Stein, really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Bye-bye everybody. Bye now.